Good morning, everybody. It's a real honor to be invited to present my information today from the Rodale Institute, and I apologize that I can't do it in French, and I'm going to challenge all of you to listen in English, and I'm going to assume that what Jose said is true, but I have no idea. <laughs> I want to talk about a couple of things today. I'm going to focus my attention and my energy on the history of our long-term farming systems trial. I'm going to use that as the basis to talk a bit from, but I'm going to talk about a bunch of different things. This is a photograph of our founder of the Rodale Institute. His name is J.I. Rodale. He was not a farmer. He was a businessman. But he understood how important the food was that he ate to his own personal health. So what he was telling us as farmers when he wrote this sentence on a blackboard in 1942, healthy soil equals healthy food equals healthy people. What he was telling us as farmers is that our job is not to produce food. Our task as farmers and researchers is not even to manage the soil. Our task is to produce healthy people. We do produce food and we do manage the soil to do that. But there's a different filter that we make our decisions from when we think about our end goal of producing healthy people. Our farming systems trial started in 1981. And it started because Bob Rodale, G.I. Rodale's son, was going to Washington, D.C. and talking about the politics of agriculture. And he was stressing the need to create policies that support organic agriculture. And the politician said, one of the problems you have is you don't have very good science. And so we created our institution to develop science around the concept of organic production. The other thing they did was the United States Department of Agriculture did a survey in 1980. And they talked to farmers in the, in the United States and said, if what the Rodale Institute is saying is true, why aren't you transitioning to organic? Obviously, there's some barriers to the adoption of these practices. And one of the barriers that farmers identified was this thought that nitrogen was going to be limiting in organic systems. Most of the time, most organic farmers, it was thought, needed to have animals in their system because you needed manure. Therefore, if you did not want to have animals or did not have access to animal manure, you could not be organic. That was the thought. And so we created an experiment based on nitrogen sources. We have three main systems in our farming systems trial. The first one, we said, OK, let's pretend that that's true. We do need manure. So we have a manure-based system here. But some of us paid attention in junior high school chemistry. And we remembered that 78% of the air we breathe is nitrogen. Nitrogen is not a limiting uh, material on Earth. Now, that nitrogen is not available to the plant. That's true. But we do have legumes. There is this component in nature that will take nitrogen out of the air and fix it in the soil. We knew that. And so we developed a system based on legumes as a nitrogen source. And then we also have a system there, which is a, a chemical system. All of these treatments are uh, based on agronomic crops, corn, soybeans, wheat, oats, and forage crops for livestock production. And then in 2008, we added a, uh, a tillage system. Because this project is very dynamic. It is not a dead study. It is dynamic. It is changing all the time to keep pace with changes in agricultural production. So conventional agriculture today is not the same as it was 35 years ago. And so that has to change. Organic production is not the same as it was 35 years ago, and that has to change. So we constantly incorporate change into these systems while keeping the primary system intact. 
This is very challenging. It's very expensive to run a project for 35 years. To tell a funder that you're going to start a project and you're going to give them some information 30 years from now is not what they want to hear. <laughs> the other thing that we're doing when we're looking at these systems is we're constantly focusing our attention on that little piece of information that J.I. Rodell told us that our goal is to produce healthy people. So we're constantly looking not only at the production of these systems or the soil-based component of these systems, but the food quality that's coming out of these systems. So for example, in this conventional system, we spray herbicides for weed control. Herbicides kill weeds, no question. But our goal as farmers isn't to kill weeds, it's to produce healthy people. Do herbicides produce healthy people? That's the question. Does spraying Roundup make people healthy? Nobody can say that's true. Even the people from Monsanto would not say that that's true. Because that wasn't their goal, that wasn't their vision. And we're suggesting, and I'm challenging all of you, to rethink your vision of food production. You all have goals for being here. My goal to be, of being here today is to inspire you to think differently about what it is you do and how you do it. And this experiment helps us to do that. It's a fairly complex experiment. This is just a field map of what's going on out there. Initially, there were eight replications of each of those treatments, and now because we split them by tillage, there's four replications of each treatment, and it's fairly complex. We look at many different things in this experiment. We're looking at crop diversity. We're looking at living ground cover, the percentage of the time that the ground is covered. We heard some, some conversations this morning already about soil health soil microbiology. Soil microbiology depends on getting, capturing energy from the sun. So if you drive from here to our farm in Pennsylvania, you will see mostly either dead or bare ground. And then if you turn west and you head to Iowa, you will see nothing but bare ground. Nature hates bare ground. There's nothing there to capture the energy from the sun and give it to the microbial life in the soil. So the microbial life in the soil goes, goes dormant or it dies. The other thing that happens with, with using chemical systems is we kill off many of the beneficial microbes that are in the soil. You would not spray your children or your pets with chemicals on a routine basis and then douse them with salt. But that's what we're doing to the life in the soil. And what G.I. Rodell was telling us is that if we think about the soil as a, living, a system of living organisms based on biology, then we can work that biology just like we exercise ourselves and improve the system, and improve the health of the system while we use it. So I'm going to show you some data that shows that our yields are comparable to conventional systems. And that's because we've des developed a methodology to improve the health of the soil while we're producing crops. If all of you exercise, you don't wear out, you get healthier. If you don't feed yourself right, and you don't sleep right, and you don't drink right, then you will wear out. So it's how we, uh, how we put these practices into place that's incredibly critical. So I have already mentioned we look at fertilizer sources, and we look at weed management systems. I know nobody can read that, and it's not important. I just wanted to show you that this image and the next image, and this number down here, 46, is a couple years old, but that's how many uh, peer-reviewed journal articles have come out of this experiment, documenting the information that I'm trying to present today. So it's not just Rodale Institute saying this is true. This is a community of scientists that have worked on our, in our infield laboratory that document that the information that we're presenting here today or the information that you read online or in any of these research papers is actually accurate and true. And we think that's incredibly important. And while starting an experiment like this is expensive and is challenging for any organization or institution, once you get it in place, it's really easy to invite other participants to come into your project and superimpose their experiment in your infield laboratory. And I would invite any of you that are interested in doing that to contact us and see if we can work out some kind of an arrangement where you can put your, collect your data out of our infield laboratory. 
Of course, we look at yields. But more importantly, we're going to look at the soil health. We're going to look at water quality. We're going to look at the energy analysis and the economics of this experiment. Because yield, if yield is the only measuring stick we use to judge the success of our food production systems, we are doomed. It's an important piece. Of course, we have to produce product. But it is not it like, it's not the, like a factory. It's not the only thing that we judge ourselves on. My son-in-law is a mill manager for Alcoa Aluminum, and he's judged, his milk is judged on the production quantity that they make, nothing else. The quality is important, but they have to make so many tons of aluminum coming out of that plant. That's what he's judged on. We cannot do that with biological systems. They're far too complex and unpredictable. So yield alone is a very poor measuring stick of the success of our systems. Because in that aluminum plant, you can wear the factory out, you can wear the mill out, and you'll build a new one or buy a new one or do whatever you need to do to get a new one. When you wear out the soil, you're in trouble. Because you can't just go and get more. So let's take a look at some of the, the data that comes out of our, our experiment. And when we're looking at, at long-term yields, if you discount the last bar, at, at this bar right here, that blue bar, if you discount that, the yields are the same over 30 years. Now, that doesn't mean that every year the yields are exactly the same. Again, this is looking at uh, corn, soybeans, and wheat. If you look at conventional corn and conventional soybeans, with all the breeding that's been done over the last decades, and with G GMO products, genetically modified products, we have created a thoroughbred racehorse that can really run in terms of yield. But it only runs fast when the track is perfect. When the racetrack gets muddy or the racetrack gets dry, those systems collapse. It's a finely tuned precision machine. But everything has to be right in order for it to function. And when we look at weather patterns around the world, did I do that? No, you missed it. missed the wind. <laughs> okay. If we look at our racetrack and we look at what climate impacts are doing to our growing systems, we notice that the weather patterns are shifting and changing. And it doesn't matter where you look in the United States or I would argue Canada as well, there isn't a time period where at some point in time we're having uh, regional droughts or regional periods that are too wet too cold, spring is really late here, it's late in Pennsylvania too. We're getting all these anomalies in our weather patterns. The organic systems perform very well when there's a problem. So when you look at dry years, which we're looking at here, organic systems out yield conventional systems. It makes perfect sense. And most scientists would argue, well, that makes sense. And if you look at the kinds of uh, crutches that we're, that we're creating in the United States with crop insurance, we have crop insurance to, pre to prevent farmers from losing money in drought years. I would argue that what we need to do is use that money to change the soil so that we drought proof our soils and we have good yields all the time. Look at what's happening with our soils. I think even in this room with this old image uh, in this poor light, you can see the difference between the organic and the conventional soil with your naked eyes. Those soils were taken 10 feet apart from each other in the, in, the, in the same field. So what that's showing us is that the way we farm will impact the soil. You can impact it positively or negatively depending on what you're doing with your farming systems. What's really exciting, and these are Dr. Ray Weil from the University of Maryland. It's a kind of a famous picture. He's been holding, holding those soils for years now. Look what happens when you put those soils in water. What this is telling us is that because of the way we're farming, using chemical-based agriculture, we have destroyed the soil's ability to relate to water. The reason the Mississippi River is muddy is not because it's supposed to be muddy, it's because we've changed the soil's ability to re react with water, and that conventional soil, look at what happens when you put it in water. It dissolves. There's no structure to it. It can't help but wash away. And it's not the soil's fault, it's not the plant's fault, it's our fault as farmers. 
Now, we took soil that looked like the conventional soil, because this field was conventionally farmed where, it, where we have our farming systems trial. It was in continuous corn for 25 years before we rented it, and now we bought it and we own it. So we took soil that looked like this, that had around 1.5% organic matter, and we changed it to soil that has 5% organic matter. And while we did that, we produced equal yields. What we've done in Iowa, and I would argue parts of Quebec as well, is we've taken soil that looked like this and we turned it into that. And what's worse is we haven't stopped there, it's still going downhill. So when we talk to farmers around the world uh, that have been on the same land for generations, many farmers will tell us that the health of their soil is continuously degrading over time. We're masking those problems with huge amounts of inputs. And so our yields stay high, and nobody's arguing with that. But our goal, while it is to produce healthy people, it's not to produce healthy people for one generation. It's to produce healthy people for multiple generations, literally thousands of years. We cannot farm the way we're farming today for thousands of years because we're going to destroy the very resource that we need to produce that, that crop. And what this is showing, this is an amalgamation of all of the treatment, all of the replications of conventional legume and manure, all kind of blended together. And what it's showing is that over time, only the systems that are being farmed organically are, are sequestering more carbon. And that information has really been uh, uh, substantiated in many different places. Uh, Iowa State, uh, Dr. Rattan Lal has done a lot of work on this as well, and he would argue that that makes perfect sense to him. Because in the conventional system, we're not really doing anything to sequester carbon, even with no-till. With no and we do have no-till systems in here. Uh, but what, what we need is we need to use cover crops, and we use, need to use other tools that we have in our toolbox to encourage carbon sequestration. And what's more important, we're sequestering carbon at much greater depths in this system. Why is that important? That's important because when you take carbon and you move it down from that very surface layer, you sequester it in a way that's very uh, permanent. And it can, will stay for a very long time. It's not very volatile. And this is what happens in these systems when we change the soil. We change the soil's ability to relate to water. It did not rain more on this corn plot. These are not irrigated plots. This is dry land farming. In fact, the conventional corn was planted two weeks earlier than the conventional corn. And when we first planted it, it germinated, it looked great. And then it stopped raining. And the organic corn didn't recognize that loss in water because it had plenty of reserves in the soil because we've changed the soil. Again, I don't expect anybody to read this. I just wanted to point out, this is a, just a random soil test from the production side of our farm, of our research farm. And what we're showing is that our organic matter content on what many people consider to be worn out uh, old soils that are very, um, have a high uh, shale fragment, they're, they're very coarse, porous soils. We now have organic matter contents across the farm that range at the low end here, 4.5 to a high of 7% organic matter. And we did that on a farm scale while we pro were producing yields that were either equal to almost every year better than our county averages. If we only get county average on our farm, I feel pretty upset as a farm manager. We prefer not to be average. This is not a chart of soil. This is a chart of the New York Stock Exchange. The reason I put it up here is because what Testing soil is very complex. Soil is not static, it's very dynamic. It changes and moves uh, almost as fast as we do. If I take your blood pressure at one moment and take it a, a little bit later after you ran a race, it's gonna be completely different. Well, so is the soil. So how we as scientists interact with the soil is very challenging because it's hard to capture information. You're only getting a little snapshot of window in time. So if, for example, I looked at the health of my soil at this point in time, where it's where going down, I would say, oh my gosh, the health of my soil is heading down. If I looked at it over there, I'd go, oh my god, I'm doing great, it's really going through the roof. The reality is we want to look at trends over time. That means we need a lot of data. You need to sample a lot. The New York Stock Exchange samples every couple of seconds. 
Certainly on a daily basis you can get a report, but you can ch I can check it on my cell phone right now and then I can check it a couple minutes later and it's going to be completely different. The same is true with the soil. And what we want to do is we want to look at that trend line over time. Some of the information that we're gathering can only be gathered over a long period of time. For example, carbon and carbon sequestration. Those changes in the soil, while they happen uh, rapidly, they're hard for us to measure. The difference between 2% and 5% is very hard to measure. We can, even, we can see it with our eyes, but it's, sometimes it's hard to measure because it fluctuates a little bit. It's a little bit like uh, those of you who have children or grandchildren. If you put your children to bed and you get them up in the morning, as scientists, we know they grew. But you can't see it. But if you put them to bed today and you woke them up 20 years later, you'd be like, oh my god. <laughs> Look how big, you can see the difference. And that's the way biology works in the soil. It's, it, it happens over time and we need to be patient in some cases to see those changes. And we as a people and a society and particularly as farmers are not very patient. We want to see results immediately. Just put this up here to show you that we are now looking at the impacts of this carbon sequestration on climate change. Because we think it's really important for us to expand beyond just talking to farmers, but talk to policymakers to help them support the work, or at least that we at the Rodale Institute want to do. I want to talk about water as well, because water is incredibly important in the system. And we have about 100 of these intact soil core lysimeters out in the field where we're measuring the movement of water through the system. And they're kind of tricky to pump out, and interns that do a really poor job of pumping them out and crush the carboy underneath, we send them down in a pit and make them fix it. And then they do it right the next time. And we have about, I think at last count I saw, we had 45,000 data points on water alone from this experiment. But what's really interesting is we can document scientifically that in the organic systems, we're, we're, we're reducing the runoff of water. So when we have heavy storm events, we're capturing that water. We're getting more infiltration into our systems. And that's why we see the corn doing better. I mean, this all makes sense. And we can see it and we can track it with real data and real numbers. The other thing that we're able to track is we're able to track what's happening with those pesticides and those salt-based fertilizers that we're putting in the system that are very, in, they're, they're effective in what they do, but they're very inefficient. Inefic inefficiency is, the, is the, uh, the, the best thing that happens to salespeople. You know, chemical salespeople love inefficiency because you have to buy more of it. I have to buy more of it as a farmer. Uh, but it is, it is effective in what it's trying to do. Atrazine, for example, is very effective at killing weeds. It also is very effective at percolating into the groundwater so we get to drink it. Let's talk a little bit about energy. We're trying to produce food. We're trying to produce healthy food and healthy people, and it takes energy to do that. What we've been able to document is that in our organic systems, we use 45% less energy to produce the same amount of product out the other end. Anybody that thinks energy is going to continue to go down in price, I know gasoline or diesel fuel at the pump is pretty reasonable right now, but it's not going to stay there. It's eventually going to go back up. Energy is incredibly expensive. So why would we waste it growing food when the biology of the system will do it for us literally for free? And that energy is not just on-farm energy. We look at where all the energy is in this entire system, and you can see that the majority of the energy on the conventional side is in fertilizer production. Nitrogen fertilizer is linked directly to uh, natural gas production. They're inherently linked. In fact, uh, PepsiCo, who owns Tropicana orange juice, did a study, uh, it was uh, in the, uh, in the in New York Times did a big, big article about it a few years ago, where Tropicana wanted to look at its carbon footprint and how much energy it was consuming to put orange juice on the tables of Americans and Canadians all around the, the globe. And their thought was that they were going to be able to reduce transportation, packaging, labeling, whatever it was. And what they found was that 58% of their energy went into the fertilizer in orange trees. And all they have to do is plant legumes under the orange trees and they can take away the nitrogen fertilizer. They can cut their carbon footprint by 58% just by changing the way they fertilize their trees. That doesn't mean they have to be organic. They can still spray the trees with whatever they want. 
because that's very, a very small amount of the energy consumed is in the herbicides, the pesticides, compared to nitrogen fertilizer. So why are we as a society still supporting the production of nitrogen fertilizer and as farmers we continuously use more and more and more of it? It doesn't make any sense. We heard uh, from the economist here talking about uh, uh, values and prices. And I'm going to show you some information here that, oh, I'm sorry, this is still energy. Uh, I have an economic budget that looks just like this. If you look at these energy budgets, you can see that every time we get into the conventional system, whether it's tilled or no-tilled, we use, we use much more energy than in the organic systems. And we can see where that energy goes. At the same time, we're, em we're emitting fewer greenhouse gases, 40% fewer greenhouse gases. If you multiply this across the landscape of agriculture, what it's saying to us is uh, agriculture needs to be at the bargaining table when it comes to climate change. Currently, agriculture is not part of the discussion. We have a buy. Doesn't matter where you go, uh, Copenhagen, uh, Kyoto, uh, wherever you want to go, where they're talking about carbon, agriculture is set off to the side. They go, oh, we don't want to mess with agriculture. Well, the problem with that is so a lot of farmers go, oh, good, we're in the clear, we don't have to do anything. The problem is if you're not at the table uh, as part of the problem, you can't be considered part of the solution. And if you're not part of the solution, you'll never get rewarded for anything that you do. So agriculture needs to be at the table. We have a huge role to play. If you look at the landscape around the world, we manage the, the majority of the landscapes that's actually managed out there, and we can have a, a huge positive impact on climate change. Let's talk about economics for a minute here. Uh, again, this is the economics that we're looking at here are on grain crops, not vegetables and fruits, because that's a whole different set of dynamics. But what we're seeing is if we look at the income over expenses, because, at least currently, uh, the marketplace rewards farmers who produce organic crops. For example, conventional corn today is selling in the U.S. I don't watch it that much, but somewhere around $3.50. Oh, we measure by bushels because we're kind of like that. Uh, $3.50 a bushel. Organic corn is over $13 a bushel. That's a huge difference. So our income is higher. Our expenses are less. I, don't, I, I, I really stink at economics. But I can see that if my income is higher and my expenses are lower, even I can read this chart and know as a farmer, I'm going to have a greater net return and I'm going to make more money. And while farmers like to talk about yield, the reality is farmers do not take corn to the bank. They take dollars, just like every other industry in the world. So as farmers, we need to think about how many dollars we're creating and how many dollars we're putting in our pocket and how we're improving the resource that we're using to do that. So if we can get similar yields, make more money, save energy, produce less greenhouse gas, why wouldn't we do that? And that's just a, another chart showing you where all of those uh, expenses are in the system. And they're at different places. The one thing that farmers typically will notice is that we have more money spent on the farm for fuel and for labor. And that's true. But as a farmer, what do you have control over? Your labor and the inputs that you put in from the farm side. When you're purchasing herbicides, uh, fertilizers, all that other stuff, you, you have no control over that. When herbicide prices go up, all you can do is pay the bill. It's going down. I hope that's not an indication of people's energy levels. <laughs> if it is, I apologize. But the point is, as farmers, we have more control over those particular components. Let's look at some of the economics here and look at the budgets. And I put a budget up here that's just for corn. And we do not have an economist at the Rodale Institute. So we worked with the, uh, some folks at Mississippi State University. So again, another indication another indication where partnerships are incredibly important to us and we work with other experts in the field for two reasons. One, they have the expertise and we don't. But even if we did, it 
it broadens that sphere of influence to say, why would Mississippi State does not have a dog in the race? So they can look at this data uh, very objectively. And what they're showing us when we look at this information is, if we had, if we yielded 100 bushels to the acre of corn, which is a relatively low yield, I'll, I'll give you that. But let's just pick that number to start with. In conventional corn that uses a chisel plow as tillage, for every acre that, the, that the, our farm would have produced, we would have lost $16. We would have paid $16 for the privilege of farming that acre of land. And farmers say, oh, well, I don't do that. I use no-till, you know, I'm better. Actually, you lost $85 an acre. And then farmers will say, well, I don't get 100 bushel. I actually get 150, which is, our, is the yield uh, goal for our farm, or 200 bushel, where you can actually show a profit. And this profit that we're showing is, is pro kind of good for a conventional grower, but it does not count any land expenses. So if you're paying a mortgage or you're paying rent on your land, uh, rent in the United States is often around $300 an acre. So if you get 200 bushel to the acre, you're actually barely breaking even in, in conventional no-till. You need to get 200 bushel just to break even if you're paying land, land rents. Look at the two organic systems. We're making money no matter where you look at it. It's almost impossible to not make money on organic corn in the United States today. You would have to be the worst farmer in the world to lose money. And yet we don't have farmers transitioning as rapidly as we would like to see. Uh, in 2015, we see a huge surge in the interest of moving to organic because of the prices. I will say, any farm that is uh, being managed poorly and is looking at organic as the salvation of that farm, they're going to be in trouble. Because the only thing that increases when you move from conventional to organic is your management skills. That's what you're getting rewarded for. Farmers have to be good managers. If you're a poor manager in conventional, you're going to be horrible as an organic farmer. Farmers don't always like to hear that. But by the same token, if you're a, uh, a good manager of resources and, and uh, people, then you're going to succeed really well in organic farming. And isn't that what we want? We want the best managers out there managing the landscape that we, uh, that we all really need. So what we're saying in summary is that over 30 years, we can produce the same yield as conventional agriculture. I, we're going to probably discuss that and argue about that a little bit, uh, hopefully after, after my presentation. So we produce the same yield. While we're doing it, we improve the health of the soil. So we're exercising our soil. Our soil is getting healthier while we do that. We're using 45% less energy. We're emitting 40% less greenhouse gas. And oh, at the same time, because these are grain-based systems, we're three to four times more profitable. If this was uh, business 101 at the university, you couldn't find one student that wouldn't say, let's make the change. And so that's what we're arguing we need to start to do. In 2015, our farming systems trial is going to change a little bit because we want to exploit the characteristics of each system. So for example, our livestock system, uh, because the way you know, science doesn't always mimic uh, what happens in production. For example, in the past we planted hay crops and we only kept them there for one year. Farmers don't plant hay for livestock production and only keep it one year, they'll keep it for four or five years. So that's going to happen in the systems moving forward. Uh, initially, we were afraid we couldn't get funding to keep the experiment going. It started as a five-year project. I think we finally convinced ourselves that people are interested in this and we'll get the money to keep it going. So we're going to put more long-term uh, crops in the rotation. We're going to look a lot more closely at the soil microbiology. We now have a, a Dr. Chris Nichols is in charge of this experiment. She's a soil microbiologist that just came to us last year from the USDA. And we're going to begin to attempt to uh, address the nutrient density of these crops as well. Because it's not just, the goal can't be even with yield just to produce tons and tons of stuff. The stuff has to have some value, some nutritive value in, in order for it to be worthwhile producing. And we have to start to look at that. Now, there's a reason that we till soil as organic farmers. And we want to talk a little bit more about soil health. And as farmers, we, it could be argued convincingly 
that we till the soil too much. Again, we know that herbicides work. If I spray Roundup, it's going to kill weeds. That's what it's designed to do, and that's what it does. It also kills mycorrhizal fungi. That's not the, that wasn't the intent of the manufacturer of Roundup, but in fact, that's what happened. It's also a great antibiotic, and it kills all the bacteria in the soils, too. Not all of them, but it does kill most of the good bacteria, and what you're left is you're left with a microbial population that can survive in this soup. And that's not necessarily the microbial population that we want to produce healthy plants and healthy people. We're all linked to the soil. Because it's really about the life of the soil. Everything that we're talking about here, our lives are, are intrinsically linked to those critters in the soil. Hard to imagine, but it is. And this goal of moving from 1% organic matter to 5% organic matter is a huge change. If I can see it with my eyes, imagine the microbial life that lives in that soil and the changes that they can see and the changes it makes in their populations and their dynamics. Here's another plot from our farming systems trial. Both these plots were being prepared and planted into wheat. Uh, the one on the right is the conventional plot and that was chisel plowed and wheat was planted. This one over here was actually moldboard plowed. It's an organic plot. You can see the difference in the color as the soil is drying out. Look what happens when it rains. The conventional system, the water runs off and it's muddy. The organic system, that water all comes into the soil where that microbial life can use it, where we can store it and release it back into the plant. So the way that we got from one of those soils to the other is by using cover crops. Cover crops are the key to success, and I don't care whether you're an organic farmer or a conventional farmer, if you want to improve the health of the soil, there's no more cost-effective tool to use than cover crops. But as farmers, we, we, you know, we, as organic farmers, we don't have herbicides, so we're going to go out there and we're going to till the soil, and we can all agree that tillage has its drawbacks. If, if you're a microbiologist, you know that there are hundreds of billions of microbes and earthworms holding that tractor up. <laughs> and that's a lot of work. The other thing that happens in organic farms, because we talk, think about weed management, once we till the soil, we sentence ourselves to secondary tillages. We have to keep tilling the soil over and over. Not as deep, but we keep going over the field and over it and over it trying to manage weeds. Every time that goes through the field, picture yourself as an earthworm. That is not a good day. And we open ourselves up to erosion, and we can all agree that that's bad. But just because we're organic doesn't mean we have to do that. What if we think differently about how we manage weeds on organic farms? Anybody here have a garden where you grow crops in your backyard? Yes, of course. We learned a long time ago that if we put mulch on the surface of the soil, we can stop annual weeds from expressing themselves. You can use straw, newspaper, I don't care what you put a sheet of plywood on the ground, weeds won't grow. Annual weeds won't germinate and grow. How do we use that piece of biology, that piece of information to produce crops? If I told you to go out and mulch uh, a 400 acre field of corn, yeah, you would laugh. <laughs> but what if we grow the mulch right in the field? And what if we don't do anything by hand we just terminate the cover crop, in this case mechanically without any herbicide, and we create a mulch. This is uh, work that Dr. Jeff Mitchell was doing with me uh, at the University of California at UC Davis. This is his, his equipment. There's no annual weeds going to germinate here. We have roller crimpers all over the world now uh, based, on, based on my design. In the beginning, we said, well, if, let's look at tools that are already kind of out there, off-the-shelf tools. Anybody ever get for Christmas a tool that says one tool does all? <laughs> Do you ever use it? It's a nice thought, but it doesn't work. And so we were using other tools to try to accomplish a goal, and they weren't, it wasn't working. For example, we used mowers. We said, well, let's just mow that cover crop off. The problem is every mower that's on the market in some way, shape, or form gathers up that mulch and it bunches it up. If it gathered it from one place, it means it's not somewhere else. Any place it isn't, the weeds are going to grow. 
So that didn't work. Oh, the other thing that happened was when you shred it with a mower, you create lots of edges where all the microbiology can start working on it to decompose it, and we want it to stay in place. We tried some rollers that are out there on the market that are used for tillage. Uh, it looks good in the picture. It didn't work. Nothing really seemed to work until we created a roller of our own that was designed just to kill cover crops. And we put it on the front of the tractor because if you put something on the, on the back of the tractor, then the first tool that touches the cover crop isn't the tool, it's the rubber tires of a tractor, which may or may not be a good crimping tool depending on the condition of the soil and the cover crop. Anybody who mows hay for a living, you don't drive over the hay and then mow it. The mower sits off to the side or is in front. So we put this in the front of it. The other thing that we did was, because we put it in the front of the tractor, and I am not an agricultural engineer, I did design this tool, uh, most of it by mistake, but it worked. If you put this blade on and you put it on one end and it goes straight to the other end, what happens is you have a blade in the air and a blade on the ground, a blade in the air and a blade on the ground, and it bounces. And it's on the front of the tractor, which means you feel that bouncing. And then you're bouncing through the field and then nobody wants to do it because, well, maybe you send your hired man out to do it, but you don't want to do it. So I was uh, literally watching my wife roll pasta in the kitchen. You ever see a pasta roller? It looks like a rolling pin, has blades on it, and they're in a spiral shape. So it's perfectly smooth. The, the rolling pin doesn't bounce. It just rolls real smooth, cuts the pasta. Perfect. So that was my idea. So in my, my brain, I grabbed a hold of each end of that cylinder and I twisted it. The problem with that is you created a screw. And we farm on hills. If you're screwing the front of the tractor uphill, that's OK. But when you go the other way, you're going downhill. And that's not so good. So we, we, we were I literally, we were standing, my neighbor and I were standing, and I was leaning on a New Holland hay bind that has those uh, rubber rollers that crimp the hay as it goes through. And he said, why don't you make it like that? And I said, like what? He goes, like that. And he pointed to the rubber roller. So if you look at this, it's the exact same shape as a New Holland hay bind. The other thing we did was we leaned these blades 7 to 10 degrees off of 90 degrees. Because if the blade is, comes at 90 degrees, it rips and pulls as it leaves the surface of the soil. But if you lean it backwards, it lifts off at an angle, and there's no ripping and tearing of the cover crop. Everything stays in place. And suddenly, we have a system that works. This field here. These are just two production fields. They're not research plots, so it's not randomized or replicated. But this was a field that was in alfalfa. It's a perennial. You can roll a perennial all day with a roller, and you're not going to kill it. It's not a magic tool. So this one had to get plowed. Over in the other field, we had a field of hairy vetch. It's a winter annual. You can kill that with a roller. So in this field, I went over the field nine times and got 143 bushels of corn. Over there, I went over the field twice. It's an organic system, no plowing, no cultivation. I got 160 bushels of corn. So I got more corn, fewer weeds, better yield, less work. I'm not lazy, but I like that. <laughs> this is a field of hairy vetch. This is what it looks like over the hood of the tractor. We're actually saying that field is ready to plant corn, uh, whether you're organic or conventional. We have as many conventional farmers now using this system as organic farmers. Uh, Warren Buffett is one of the richest men in the world. His son, Howard, is a farmer. Howard Buffett came out and looked at our system, and he said, why would I spray Roundup when I can do that? Howard Buffett is not organic. He doesn't care about organic. He does care about soil health, and he does care about his wallet. So if you're not buying herbicide, you're improving the health of your soil, you're getting free nitrogen, it makes perfect sense, and you're not spraying Roundup. So this is a corn planter going through the field planting corn. That's what an organic corn field looks like when it's finished being planted. Here's the corn. It's not that the work isn't being done. It's just that the biology of the system is doing the work, not me. And the biology of the system is much more effective and efficient than I am. And that's why we have fewer weeds when we let the biology do it than when we try to step in and do it ourselves. There are tricks to this system, of course. You're not planting into soil. You have to cut through this thick carpet of residue, and so you may have to change your planter. You may have to adjust other pieces in the system. Seeds that are laying on the surface 
are not going to germinate and grow. You've got to get your seed in the ground. So this is what our corn planter looks like today, our soybean planter. And I plant pumpkins with this. Somebody talked about pump pumpkins. Uh, we plant pumpkins with this planter. We plant uh, cucumbers with this planter. This is the planter right here. Everything else is designed to get a slot through that heavy residue and get my seed in the ground without doing any tillage. And if we do it right, this is what organic crops should look like. If it works with corn, it works with soybeans. So if you can have a crop that looks like this with soybeans, we get 60 bushel yield, literally no work. All we did was plant it and come back and harvest it. No herbicide, no weeding, no cultivation, no tillage. We did use some tillage to get the cover crop established. So there is tillage in the system. And, and you know, we have to do that, at least in, at this point in time, we feel we have to do that. Um, if you look at our landscape just like yours, it wants to be about 70 feet tall and it wants to be a hardwood forest. And it's going to keep trying to move in that direction. If you're a conventional farmer, you're going to spray herbicide to reset that, that uh, clock. We use tillage to reset the clock. But I would rather till the system to get cover crops in than till the system to get cash crops in, because if I till the system for cash crops, now I have to cultivate for weed management. And that's a lot of extra work. If I till for cover crops, I just till, plant the cover crops, and walk away and forget it. And the cover crops and the biology do all the work. Now, if you're using this system or thinking about using these kinds of systems in your production strategy, you have to pay attention to cover crops. What you've done is you've, in the philosophy is you've elevated the cover crop to the most important crop on your farm. Nobody would plant their tomatoes two months late and expect a full yield. But yet people plant cover crops way too late and say the system doesn't work. I'm sure I'll hear in the questions that you can't do it in Quebec. Because I was just in Germany last week and they said you can't do it in Germany. I was in France two years ago, they said you can't do it in France. They're doing it in France now. I was in Argentina three years ago, they said you can't do it in Argentina, it won't work. Now they're rolling all over, There's, I've, I've seen thousands of acres rolled in Argentina. It doesn't work in uh, Nebraska, until now it does work in Nebraska. It didn't work in Russia, but now it does. It works when people decide they want to make it work. And, and finding a partnership between a research organization like this and farmers that want to use these tools is incredibly important because the system has to be designed and tweaked for your individual area. Because what you're going to do is going to be different than me, but it will work. All this is saying is that this picture was taken on April 1st, and you can see the difference in stands based on when the, the cover crop was planted. If you want this cover crop to suppress your weeds, you have to get it in in August or September. If you plant it in October, it'll germinate and grow, but you're not going to get what you want out of that system. That's all that's saying. This is a farmer in Wisconsin who in, 20, in 2014 uh, began planting using this system. He is an organic farmer. Uh, that's his planting equipment. He's on a bigger scale than us. This is a field from his cab. And the reason I use this picture is, and this is his wording, weed control, get it right in the fall. That's organic farming philosophy at its best. If you get up today and you think you're going to manage weeds in your field because you're going to plant this spring, it's too late. You should have been thinking about that years ago. You have to think in multiple dimensions. That's that management tool that organic farmers have to capture. And the more complex you make the biology of your system, and these are complex biological systems, the more in tune you have to be with what's going on. So he wrote that, not me. He said, get it right in the fall. Here's his rye field, organic rye. Here he is planting. And here's his crop of soybeans. He said in 2014, he got the highest yield of so organic soybeans he's ever gotten in his life, and he had fewer weeds than he's ever had in his life. And he farms about 2,000 acres. The, he did 640 acres like this. So when people say, does it work at different scales, it certainly does. Well, if it works with corn and soybeans, it's going to work with any crop we choose to plant. We just have to match the cover crop up with the cash crop. So here we have pumpkins. We have transplanters that will set transplants into these systems. 
So you can do tomatoes and peppers and broccoli, whatever it is you want to do. You just have to be creative and inventive. Here's some tomatoes. And while these tomatoes in the front look more yellow and poor, this was a nitrogen experiment. We were playing around with different ratios of legumes in the cover crop mix. And I couldn't get a good picture where the tomatoes look better because you couldn't see the pathway. So here you can see, even when there's no uh, support from the crop itself, there's no weeds growing in there. And we've seen, you see that in your garden, we see it all the time. It makes perfect sense. We just have to put it to work. Oh, and it's really kind of interesting because this was an experiment at the Institute, and when it was done, we opened, and everybody had their data out, it, because it was a fairly large plot, we opened it up to the public for pick your own tomatoes, and they said, come in and pick organic tomatoes. And one day I was walking by along, there's a little bit of a road, you can just see it up in the top corner there, it goes right along that field. And as I was walking by, there were some little old ladies in there picking tomatoes, and they said, oh look, they put straw down so we wouldn't get our shoes dirty. <laughs> that wasn't the reason, but if you can market that, why not? This is Dr. Gladys Zanotti, uh, one of our researchers at the Institute, just holding up some mulch. At the end of the season, you can see we're still getting good suppression of, of weeds. You can see a few weeds coming up in there but they're certainly not yield limiting. That field yielded 150 bushels of corn. The concept is scale neutral. I don't care if it's a big scale or a small scale. It's the biology of the system that's doing the work and the cover crop, not, not me, not you. So here you can see a large roller. This one is in uh, uh, Illinois. That is a conventional farmer, not an organic farmer, planting soybeans. And down here in this picture, I don't know if you noticed, but that woman is actually standing in a greenhouse. And she doesn't have a tractor, and she doesn't have a roller crimper. She has a little piece of wood that she screwed a piece of angle iron to it, and she's stepping on it. And she created a crimping tool using her own body weight to crimp the floor. She said, I transplant, hand transplanted tomatoes into that. I got no soil-borne diseases. I had the nicest tomatoes I ever had in my greenhouse, and I didn't have to pull one weed the whole season. Why not? If it works in Pennsylvania and it works everywhere else, this is a friend of mine that was on a sabbatical last year uh, from Iowa State in Italy, and she came upon this guy using a roller crimper to plant crops in Italy. And she said, where'd you get the idea? He said, oh, on the internet from Rodale Institute. So <laughs> they, they didn't even have the benefit of people coming and talking to them. But why not? Why, I mean, if, if it works in Italy and it works everywhere else, you can bet we can make it work in Quebec. Works at many different scales. Uh, down here in the corner, we have a model that's being pulled by horses because we have Amish people who are using the system. Now, it's a little trickier with a horse because you can't tie this to his nose and put the planter on his tail. <laughs> so it's a two-step operation. And I had an Amish farmer said, well, I rolled my cover crop, and I went and got the planter, and I made my first pass with the planter. When I turned around and looked, I couldn't see where to go. It just looked like a field of grass. And he said, the horses got tired of standing there. Anybody that's ever worked with horses, when it's time to go, they want to go. And he said, I, I didn't know what to do. And the horses started walking, so I just followed the horses. And when the corn came up, he said, darn if the horses don't plant straighter than I do. So it, it can work with horses. This is on raised beds with an uh, heirloom tomato grower. We designed a roller that gets the shoulders of the bed. I mean, this is just ag engineering. There are people, if there's ag engineers in the room, maybe, I don't know. But ag engineers wake up every day dreaming of problems like this to solve. We just have to give them, tell them what it is we're trying to accomplish, and they can go to work and do it. It doesn't preclude you from spraying any uh, materials that you wanted to spray. So if you want to irrigate, you can still irrigate. Uh, we have transplanters that will lay drip tape under that mulch, just like it lays it under plastic. Again, that's just ag engineering. So you can pull drip tape in and water your crops. Uh, we happen to be spraying clove oil here, but if you wanted to spray Roundup on that system, you could still spray Roundup if that makes you happy. It's, it's not strictly an organic system, but what we're trying to do with these technologies is encourage conventional farmers to look beyond what they're doing. And that's what I'm challenging you to do. Look beyond what you're currently doing to see how this could make sense in your system. How can we put cover crops to work, even if you're not organic, and start moving people on that road and in that process to get things done. Uh, because we're talking about soil, I just leave you with a quote. I started with one by J.I. Rodale. I'm going to finish with one by Wendell Berry. And Wendell Berry said, the soil is the great connector of our lives, the source, and ultimately the destination of all of us. And so it's incredibly important that we manage that soil properly. And I thank you for your time. <laughs>